Hi, and welcome to the first in a series of live webinars where we're going to explore how you can use Minecraft in education. In this first session, I would like to explore how you can use games, not just Minecraft, to support teaching and learning. My name is Simon Johnson. I'm a former ICT and computing teacher and have several years experience um, in education and I'm also a Minecraft Global Mentor. So in this session, we're going to learn the difference between gamification and game-based learning. We're going to explore the benefits of learning through gameplay. And we're also going to discover how to apply game-based theory to teaching and learning. So let's get started by exploring gamification. Now, often used in the same context as game-based learning um, and game design, gamification is actually the process of using game-like elements in traditionally non-gaming contexts, usually to make them more fun and engaging. Typical gaming mechanics include gamifying grading, competition, scaffolding learning, mastery, for example, in the form of leveling up, progress indicators, and escape rooms. I'm going to explore some of these in a little bit more detail. The first one I want to explore is gamifying grading. So this is an example that um, I stole or magpied from um, uh, a previous colleague, an English teacher. Uh, and what she did was um, when issuing a writing task, she would gamify the grading by applying values to different words based on their complexity. So for example, if a child used the word dark or dull um, or gray in their sentences, they would see three points. But if they use some a more complex or where we're like uh, threatening or malevolent, they get five points. And at the end, uh, they tell it the scores uh, and see how they did on the previous uh, against the previous session. Another way you can use gamification is to gamify behavior. Now, I used to use a tool called um, Classroom Carrots, um, and then after that, um, Class Dojo. And I always remember when I first started teaching, uh, the first thing I did was bought lots of stickers. Uh, we all remember what it was like um, visiting the dentist as a child. Um, I think the only thing that got us through that was receiving that little sticker at the end. And I remember awarding my stickers to my year seven year eight students and then one day i was teaching my year 11s and it was prep for gcc coursework and um i was going through my folders and stickers fell out of my folder and one of my year 11s said sir why don't we get stickers and i just automatically assumed that they were too old um but we all love stickers no matter what age and they can be a great incentive the great thing about tools like uh, Clash and Carrots and Class Dojo is that you can award stickers or virtual badges for things that children do, whether it's for good behavior or being on task. And then what you find happens is the other children want to earn that badge and want to know how. And they, they replicate uh, or model that behavior um, to get those badges. Another popular mechanic used in gamification is PBLs, which stands for progress bars, badges, and leaderboards. Um, often when children play games, um, they'll have a progress indicator. And what's great about the progress indicator is it shows them how far they have uh, come and shows them how close they are to the next level. And sometimes it might be that they're so close, that that's that extra incentive to push them to get to the next level. Now, I know that some teachers um, frown upon the use of tables and leaderboards. Um, it can be sometimes demoralizing, especially if a child struggles to get to the top of the leaderboard. And one thing you can use is something called ghost mode. So um, children that play games that produce a lap time, so racing games like Mario Kart is great for this, usually have a facility where um, instead of um, competing against other players, uh, you can actually try and beat your own times. This is called ghost mode. So you can apply this theory uh, when uh, using leaderboard to children. So rather than competing against the rest of the class, you can have the children uh, compete against their previous score to see if they can get better. Another strategy using gamification is scaffolding. A perfect example of this is something called Parsons problems. Now we use Parsons problems in coding to help with something called uh, cognitive load. Not familiar with cognitive load theory. Um, this explores the idea that students have a short-term memory. Um, and 
if something is too complex, it overloads that short term memory. So it, it hinders them from remembering or moving on with the task. So what we can do to alleviate that is to give them partially working solutions or just the, the components for the solution and hide all the other distracting elements. And then what they have to do is put it back together. So it could be like a jigsaw puzzle. So you could put it work in the correct order or fill in the missing pieces. But probably my favourite uh, gamification strategy is escape rooms. If you're not familiar with the escape room model, the idea is that uh, people are willingly locked in a room and then probably usually against the timer, they have to solve clues to in order to escape. Um, now, I don't recommend locking young children in rooms and hoping they escape, uh, but thankfully there is a um, more classroom friendly version of escape rooms called Breakout EDU. Rather than breaking out of a locked room, they have to break open locked objects. It could be locked cases or boxes, usually with padlocks, um, and they have to solve clues. It could be a math puzzle, or it could be a coding challenge, um, where the result is the code for the lock. Um, if you don't have physical locks, you can also use tools like OneNote or password protected Word file or Excel file. And then the students have to work at the code to open the um, unlock the, the password and then uh, um, open and access the next challenge. If you like the traditional um, idea of escape rooms where you're locked in a room, there is another safe alternative using Minecraft. So um, on the Minecraft education website, you can download pre-existing escape rooms where children are locked in a virtual room in Minecraft and they have to solve tasks, solve puzzles in order to break out of each room. So if you plan to use gamification in your classroom, here are some of my top tips. So use ghost mode if students find competition against their peers intimidating. You can also allow students to create aliases. Many children that play games online will have a gamer tag, so why not let them use a the gamer tag in the classroom? Use levels and checkpoints and other methods to show progression. Uh, and re reward students with learning badges instead of points or grades to demonstrate mastery. And finally, create a safe environment where students are allowed to fail. Uh, fail first attempt in learning. The reason why I say that is Often in games, you find that children will um, play a level and then they might crash or die at the end, but they know that they can start again and then try different strategies. Um, the problem I find in teaching is that we don't have a potential, we don't allow children to fail because of the pressures on us and the pressures on the students. Um, Allowing the children to fail in a safe environment hopefully allows them to take risks and learn from the mistakes, which is a really important skill. Another area of game-based theory is game-based learning. So game-based learning is the process of using games to achieve a defined set of learning outcomes. So games that generate data, for example, Connect Sports or Mario Kart are great for teaching math and statistics. Games that tell a story are great for developing creative writing. Puzzle games can develop problem solving. And physics based games such as Angry Birds can actually be used to explain velocity and momentum in physics. So why use games in the classroom? Well, most students won't object to playing games in the class or as part of their homework. Some students will spend hours watching YouTubers and esports videos to pick up ideas and skills. I remember when I first started teaching, I used to run a lunchtime club. Um, and children were allowed to come in, play games, catch up on homework, um, communicate with their friends. And I used to find that a lot of the children would just be watching YouTube videos of people playing games. And this, this perplexed me. And I asked one of the children one of the days, I said, wouldn't you rather be playing the game than watching someone else play the game? And the child said, well, I'm trying to learn how to beat the Ender Dragon. Or some other child said, I want to get better at FIFA. So why is this important? Because it shows us that students can focus on watching and listening if there's an education reason behind it. So why use games in education? For one, students feel like they have ownership of their learning. It creates a more relaxed atmosphere. Um, students have more fun in their lessons. Um, 
students can often be more comfortable in game environments um, and so are more proactive and open to making mistakes. I said previously, students are more likely to make risks in a game because they know at the end they'll just start again and it gives them opportunities to get better and change their strategies. It also improves engagement and concentration levels. But for me, it also contextualizes learning. And for me, context is key. I remember, again, when I first started teaching, um, I was running a GCC ICT group. Um, and one of the projects was an Excel activity where the students had to create a um, online video shop booking system. Now, most of the children had never been to a video store to purchase video um, instead they download or stream the video so it's a bit alien to them and the problem i found that activity was that it had no context or relevance so i thought how can i, I change this so one day i brought in a games console and we played a racing game all the children recorded their fastest laps and then we placed those in a, in a um, shared spreadsheet and we did things like work out the fastest and slowest lab, work out the average mean, median. And the children even created a podium using a bar chart of the, the, the top scores. Why this was important because I found that children were more engaged because they created the data themselves rather than me giving them some contrived example. So it was relevant to them, which is really important. I also find that using games can be a great impetus support in writing. I often ask uh, the question, how can you ask a child to write about something they've never experienced? The great thing about games, not just Minecraft, is especially if it tells a story, is it it's fully immersive. So they explore the 3D environments, they can hear all the sounds all around them. It instantly gives them something that they can write about. You can also use games like Minecraft in education to support other services like art, um, modern family languages, geography and history. We'll look at some of the examples in a moment. So Minecraft as a game automatically lends itself to literacy. So it's great for supporting creative writing, narrative writing, uh, role play. So children could explore uh, a traditional tale like the Three Little Pigs or create their own modern um, version. Um, they could download a Dickensian map uh, and explore uh, classics like A Christmas Carol. Uh, they can also role play. I worked with a school um, where some of the children, uh, their reading and writing age was uh, that of a seven or eight year old and they were 12 or 13. And the teacher said she was struggling to engage the children with reading and writing. And I said, have you tried to use Minecraft? Um, at the time, they were exploring the traditional story of Jack and the Beanstalk. So I worked with the digital leaders and we created uh, a representation of the book in Minecraft. And we had the children take on the role of Jack. And I remember at the end of the last lesson, uh, I was asking questions like, who is the hero? And this one girl um, was standing on the chair with a hand in the air and the other hand was over her mouth. She's desperate to answer the questions. So uh, I said, who did you think Jack was the hero? And she said, no. And I says, why not? And she says, well, Jack had climbed the beanstalk, met the giant's wife who was really nice to Jack and said, look, keep away from my husband. He gets a bit grumpy and he eats children every now and again. But Jack ignored um, that and went back up, stole from the giant, and then finally chopped down the beanstalk, killed the giant, and this is from her own words, made the giant's wife a widow, which is quite powerful. But what was even more powerful is when I spoke to the teacher later, she says, that girl, that girl is the girl that used any excuse to get out of engaging lessons. So if she's asked a question, She'll want to go to the toilet, she'll tie her shoelace, um, or she'll say she's ill. Now, I'm not saying that Minecraft is a panacea and it's going to help every child that struggles with reading and writing. But in this case, we found a hook to engage that child, which is really powerful. Uh, another way I've used Minecraft to support literacy is instruction writing. Um, I often used to ask the children, what would you like to be when you grow up? And you've got, I want to be a footballer, influencer, I want to be a YouTuber. And I thought, how can I take some of that interest and use that um, to engage them in writing. So I got the children to create something simple in Minecraft, so like a simple hut or shelter. 
and I got them to write step-by-step -step instructions to um, for someone else to recreate that as if they were a YouTuber prepping for the next big YouTube video. And I would go around the room um, and I would um, follow instructions, be pedantic um, and deliberately get some of the instructions wrong or follow them exactly. And the children would go back, no, 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 rewrite the instructions to make them better and to try and be a teacher. Another form of gamification. Another way you can use Minecraft is to support uh, maths on numeracy. So every block in Minecraft is one meter cube. So one meter by one meter by one meter. With that information, we can do a lot of things. So we can explore area and volume, but not just area and volume. We can explore the area and volume of really complex shapes. You can also explore probability, and I'll, I'll explore an, an example of this in more detail in a moment. You can look at area perimeter. You can also uh, explore scale. So I used to run a Minecraft club after school. And I remember one of the students, you've taught these students, they're really popular in class, everyone loves them, but they they don't engage in certain subjects using maths or English. So this, this student was struggling to engage in maths. But after school, they decided they wanted to create a scale model of school. So he went to the head, got some blueprints, worked out each block was a meter and created a scale model. You imagine that child's face when I told him that he was spending all his time after school doing maths. And you imagine his maths teacher surprised when I told her what he was doing. Again, it was a hook to get a child uh, engaged with maths. So here's the example I was talking about, uh, about uh, probability. Um, this is free to download from the Minecraft education website. Um, so in this example, children are given a fishing rod and asked to go fishing because you can go fishing in Minecraft and just like in real life you can catch fish you can also catch junk no shopping trolleys but you can also catch treasure as well so I'd have the children go fishing and then make a tally chart um, of all the times they catch fish treasure and junk and then from that and um, they can work at the um, probability or experimental probability of catching each You can also use Minecraft to teach computing. So built into Minecraft Education Edition specifically, there is the Code Connections app. So with this, you can code with blocks similar to Scratch. You can use JavaScript and Python. And for those that you remember, the Romers and Bbots, there's a virtual Roma in Minecraft called Agent, which the children can control as well. So. My top tips on game-based learning. Don't be afraid to let your students teach you. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes I made when I started teaching was I thought I must be the font of all knowledge. In a subject like computing and ICT, that's impossible, but it's also unhealthy. Um, there's going to be opportunities that's going to present themselves where your children are going to know more about you. And Minecraft is the perfect example. Take that opportunity. Give those students leadership skills to take over, to help you and help the rest of the class. It's also important to explain to all the stakeholders why you're doing this and the, the benefits. It's not just parents, but also the students themselves, SLT. I also recommend letting the students play the game first to get used to the game mechanics controls. So you might have some Minecraft experts in your classroom, but their experience might be using the console edition um, or the pocket edition. So using the mouse and keyboard might be a little bit alien to them. Also, don't go mad. I know teachers that have had a really successful lesson using Minecraft in the classroom. I thought, right, that's it. I'm going to use Minecraft every week. Your children are not going to uh, enjoy that and they're not going to appreciate that. Also, set clear expectations and some ground rules. Now, when I first started teaching, um, my mentor said, why don't you ask your children to create their own classroom rules? Now, I thought they were joking and setting up for a fall. But I thought, I'm going to try this and see what happens. And I was really surprised, and you'll be surprised as well, um, how um, seriously they take this role. So I found not only did they come up with really great classroom rules, but um, their consequences were uh, much harsher than I would ever come up with. But not only that, it's their rules and their consequences. So it gives them ownership of their learning. And finally, let go. Um, 
encourage independent learning. I've used strategies like C3 before me. So C3 other people before asking the teacher. And my other favorite is not self, neighbor, other teacher. I did try snog, which is self, neighbor, uh, other Google, but that didn't work so well. And you can put these all together. So remember I talked about that um, idea of um, having the students do an instruction writing task about something they've created. Well, you can combine that with gamification, uh, add points to the different words they use, the imperative verbs like attach gets three points, flip gets two points, get gets one point, and then create a lid board, either for the whole class, or remember using ghost mode where they try and beat the previous score. And use that progress indicator to show how close they are to the next level. Now I can't present a live session on gaming without mentioning eSports. eSports or electronic sports is a competitive gaming medium that challenges gamers to play against one another to win. Now the key with this is they're not playing against AI or computer opponents, they're playing against other people, just like um, they would do if they're professionals playing a sport or playing against others uh, in maybe a football match or tennis match after school. Now, it's usually offered as an extra quick activity. This means students will need to attend team meetings, practices and official matches, just as if they were playing for the, the, the school sports team. Um, but unlike other sports, eSports can be played remotely, so the cost of travel are kept down. But this is also positive for students who don't like change or unable to travel due to physical and mental health constraints. So why play eSports? Well, it, it create, promotes an environment um, of positivity, happiness, uh, promotes friendship, uh, it's gender neutral. Uh, there's also several transferable skills as well. We'll look at some of those in a moment. Uh, it can help with resilience. Remember I said about the great thing games is if you fail, you can just restart and try again. Uh, and it also encourages problem solving. But don't just take my word for it. This is the quote from Professor Janet Eyre, a pediatric neuroscientist. If you're having fun, if you're motivated, mildly competitive and focusing on the task, you will enjoy it. Enjoyment is a sign that there are chemicals in your brain which make your brain ready to learn. So playing increases the number of synapses and helps positively reorganize your brain. But there's several other facets to esports, not just playing the game. So there's a team manager, logo designer, merch designer, um, social media manager. Is this a coach and even an analyst that looks at um, how well the team has done in previous um, events and pe compares against the competition? And one of my favorites is the shoutcaster. If you ever watch uh, an esports um, event streamed, there's always a commentator, just like they have um, commentary on football and on tennis. And it's a really good skill. So why is it important? Well, esports is big money. Um, it wouldn't surprise you to hear that big football clubs like Manchester United and even Wolverhampton Wanderers are looking into signing players for their esports teams. One, they're massive prizes, and you can see some of the prize money uh, here, like Fortnite, $64 million. But even if they don't win, there's also a great marketing opportunity for those uh, clubs as well. Because um, if a child is racing a car and it's got the Manchester City uh, logo branded on the side of the car or someone's playing FIFA and they're wearing the Wolves colours, you might have fans that follow that team but then buy merchandise from that club. They may never support the team, they may never go to that club and watch a game, but they'll buy merchandise. It's all about brand awareness. And it creates new job opportunities, you know, e-branding, um, electronic merchandising. Um, and it starts to sound like a bit of a cliche, but we are actually um, developing our students and training our students for jobs that don't even exist yet. I often get asked, this is great, but can I afford to run an e-sports club? Do I need fancy equipment, expensive gaming machines. But traditionally, the answer is yes. But the great thing is that one of those games that is picking up in the esports arena is Minecraft. 
And because Minecraft Education Edition is designed for um, a number of devices, Chromebooks, iPads, laptops, it's been optimized for use with existing classroom resources and classroom equipment, which means you don't have to go out and buy new equipment, you just need a license for Minecraft. And built into Minecraft are some esports games you can pick up straight off the bat. And here's one of my favorite ones. It's called um, Pirate Cove. Vast my hearties, and welcome to Pirate Cove, part of the Make and Model eSports series. The Make and Model series allows students to challenge each other in a series of classic build battles, utilising the creative functions of Minecraft to the full, and allowing children to stretch their imaginations and to build in a fun but time-pressured, competitive-based environment. Let's take a look around the Pirate Cove arena. Below us is the spawn area, split into the two team colours, yellow and green. In the bay there are two amazing pirate ships, each one has a build platform in the team's colours. The rest of the island is fully explorable and made up of typical pirate themes, like a giant skull, a cannon and a mighty chest of gold. Arr! As you can see, the island has a small pirate population and each one can tell you a little bit more about the game we're about to play. But for the purposes of this video, we're going to dive straight in. But remember, you can check them out in the playbook or open the map and discover what they have to say for yourself. So, let's set up and start a game. First, we need a theme and some players. For this game example, we're choosing a nautical theme, but it could be anything. Ah, here are the players. Next, let's decide how long we want the game to last. In the control panel next to the team areas, you can add or take away 10 minute increments using the blue and red button panels, or even add or take away minutes. As you can see, when I press the add 10 minutes button, I get a visual notification in the game of 10 minutes. I can press it again and it updates. If I press to take away, as you'd expect, the timer updates. It also updates on the ship's sails, so when the teams are building, they can see quickly how much time they have left. This is a great feature, allowing you to create long or short sessions depending on your schedule. So let's make this game last 12 minutes by adding 2 minutes. Next, get your players to stand on their team colours. If you're a large group who want to spectate, make sure they're standing elsewhere. Once we're in position, the host of the game can press the Start Game button on the green emerald block. The student's team will immediately be teleported to their team ships and they can begin their competitive building. Each platform has an area of Build Allow blocks that allow the students to build. Let's see how they get on. OK, the timer is coming to the end. When the timer ends, we all get a notification and a small new timer on our screens appears. This is the voting time. We have a couple of minutes to look at each other's work and decide whose is better. We do this by standing on the glass area on either ship. When a student stands on this area, the team score updates on the sail. If you're live streaming or don't have enough students in the game to vote, then you can use armor stands instead. Make sure you're in teacher mode by using the command forward slash WB. Placing an armor stand on the glass area acts the same as a student standing there, and the score will update accordingly. Once the voting time ends, the scores are tallied and the winning team gets fireworks. Congratulations to the winning team. Once the game has finished, you need to reset to play again. But first, you might want to use the structure block to export the team's creative builds. 
Simply click on the block and press export. You can learn more about this in the playbook. And then remove any armor stands from the glass voting areas. And finally, go back to the spawn and press game reset button on the control board. And there you are, you're ready for the next round. When the students start a new game, they can clear the previous build with a click of a button found at the back of the build platform. And that's it. We hope you and your students enjoy Make a Model Pirate Cove Arena. Fair winds and flowing seas cheer. Ha ha. So, interested in using games in the classroom or applying gamification theory? Uh, how can you find out more? If you want to find out more, you can start by visiting the official Minecraft education website, education.minecraft.net. Don't worry, uh, all the links in this webinar uh, will be accessible in the YouTube playlist. You can also, if you use Twitter, you can tweet at PlayCraftLearn. If you want to get certified uh, and want to learn more about Minecraft, you can also join the Minecraft Education Teacher Academy. We've also recently released a new Minecraft education community for UK educators. Here you'll find education resources, news and updates for build challenges and be the first to find out about competitions. And you'll also get support from other educators and experts, including Minecraft mentors. And finally, if you like this series, why don't you check out some of the other videos and some of the other um, events in our Minecraft education series. Thank you for watching and we hope to see you in the next in our series of Minecraft education webinars.